Riemann hypothesis. Let's say you're at a number party. Most numbers are just mingling around, but there are these VIP numbers called primes, namely 2, 3, 5, 7, and their exclusive buddies. These primes are super special because they can't be divided by anyone or anything except themselves and the number one. Mathematicians are always trying to figure out the secret code of these prime VIPs' appearances. Back in 1859, a mathematician named Bernard Riemann had an idea at this number party. He whipped up a magical tool, the Riemann zeta function. Think of this function as a prime number treasure map. Now, Riemann didn't just stop there. He made a bold guess known as the Riemann hypothesis. He suggested that if you peek at where the zeta function hits zero, called the zero points, they all obediently line up on this invisible dance floor called the critical line in a mystical dimension known as the complex plane. It sounds like a mathematical fairy tale, but there's a reason why it's unsolved. The reason why this hypothesis has given everyone a headache is that this zeta function and its fancy complex plane are like the exclusive sections of the math club, blocked off and almost impossible to access. The hypothesis involves large numbers and concepts so mind-bending that even the most powerful computers scratch their heads. To crack this prime party mystery, mathematicians might need entirely new ways of thinking or math gadgets straight out of a sci-fi movie. Despite countless geniuses and number nerds trying, nobody has found a tidy proof to show that Riemann's prime party alignment holds true for all the zeros. It's one of the famous Millennium Prize problems, which can get you a million dollars if you can crack it. So if you want to be a million bucks richer, you better work on that 10th grade algebra. P versus NP problem. Imagine your computer as a culinary genius. When a problem is classified as P, standing for polynomial time, it's like following a recipe for a simple dish. It has clear steps and clear ingredients. Before you know it, dinner is served without breaking a sweat. Now for NP, or non-deterministic polynomial time, is a dish that you don't know how to cook because you don't know where to start. There's no recipe for you to follow. But if someone starts cooking it for you, you now know how to finish it. Now the question is whether or not they're the same. In other words, if you can quickly check a dish, can you quickly cook it as well? Look at it this way. If you cook a burger following a recipe, that's basically P. If you don't have a recipe for a burger, Burger, but someone starts cooking it for you to make it easier for you to check and continue cooking it yourself, that's NP. But are the two burgers the same? The processes may be different, but you still end up with a burger regardless of whether you followed a recipe or simply checked and continued the work that another person started. However, mathematicians and computer scientists believe that P does not equal NP because some problems are hard to solve, even if you could verify the solution easily. For example, deadlifting a thousand pounds is hard even if you know the solution is getting stronger and eating lots of protein. You'll still struggle to lift the weight, like how a problem that is inherently hard to solve is still hard to solve even if you know the solution. Goldbach Conjecture you know there are at least two secret admirers for every person in the world. While that may be true, good luck finding those admirers, because chances are you can't even spot your own. This is why the Goldbach conjecture remains unsolved. In 1742, a mathematician named Goldbach claimed that every even number greater than two can be expressed as the sum of two prime numbers. It sounds simple, especially for smaller numbers such as four, the sum of prime numbers two and two. But the tricky part comes in when you try to prove that this is true for all even numbers, because there are infinite combinations you can use for each even number. It's easier to find two odd numbers for smaller even numbers, but you can't be sure that this theory is true for all even numbers from 4 up to infinity. Nearly three centuries have passed, and even the most advanced computer simulations are yet to prove that Goldbach's theory was correct. It's like you're trying to find the perfect match for every sock in a drawer full of an infinite number of socks. It's not just about finding pairs of primes, because it's also about proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that every even number has a prime pair in every conceivable way. According to the conjecture, 4 million should be expressible as the sum of two primes. One possible representation is 4 million equals 1,999,979 plus 2 million 21. But you can't prove that this is the same to numbers that are several times larger, like Sherlock Holmes investigating a crime with infinite suspects. It will take some serious deductive math skills to crack this one. Collatz Conjecture 
When you're cleaning your room, there's always that one dusty corner that defies all cleaning efforts, mocking your determination with its perpetual dustiness. You try everything to clean it, but it always seems dusty. That's what the Colatz conjecture feels like for mathematicians, because as easy as it sounds, it remains unsolvable. At first, this problem sounds as simple as wiping dust off a surface. It says that if you must start with any positive integer, a number that's not a fraction, if it's an even number, you divide it by two. If it's odd, you triple it and add one. Then you take the result and repeat the process. No matter what number you start with, you'll eventually reach one. For example, you have 16, you divide it by 2 to end up with 8, you divide it with 2 again to end up with 4, you divide it by 2 to get 2, from there you divide 2 by 2 to end up with 1. It sounds easy and simple, but the problem is that nobody has been able to prove that this always happens for every single number without exception. Mathematicians have used supercomputers and all kinds of tools to solve this problem, but they have encountered an invisible wall that prevents them from concluding that it works for every number. In math, proving something for every number is almost as impossible as proving your room is dust-free in every possible corner simultaneously. The Colatz conjecture looms large because numbers stretch to infinity, making it impossible to test every single one. It's like trying to complete a jigsaw puzzle with one missing piece. Hodge conjecture Imagine you have a shape, like a donut or a ball. These familiar shapes hang out in three dimensions, with length, width, and height. But in the wacky world of math, shapes can exist in spaces with way more than three dimensions. These wild shapes are called algebraic varieties. Now try figuring out these shapes by examining their holes. In our cozy three-dimensional world, it's a piece of cake. A donut has one hole, while a ball has none. But in higher dimensions, things get bonkers, and shapes can have all sorts of bizarre holes. Mathematicians tackle these loopy shapes by turning geometric problems into algebraic ones. They break them down into simpler bits that are easier to handle because it's always easier to solve for y and x instead of why x is shaped that way. This brilliant idea is called the Hodge conjecture. Despite some progress with smaller cases, the problem remains as hard as ever. These shapes aren't your usual circles or squares, they're mind-bendingly complex. Visualizing them is like trying to solve a Rubik's cube blindfolded. Cracking the Hodge conjecture without the right pieces is like doing a jigsaw puzzle where every piece looks identical. You wouldn't have a clue where to put each piece, just like mathematicians struggle to find the right algebraic cycles for every hole. This confusing problem is one of the seven millennium prizes, with a million dollar reward for anyone who solves it. Many math geniuses have claimed to be close, only to realize it's going to take more time before they're rolling in dough. Miller-Rabin Primality Test if you try going into a bar to have a few drinks, the bartender will ask for your ID, especially if you look like you're on the younger side. This is what the Miller-Rabin primality test does, as it's like the Snoopy bartender asking a prime number for its ID to check if it's really a prime. Let's say you have a big bag of marbles, and you want to see if the number of marbles in the bag is prime. This test is like a special tool that helps you figure that out. You use it by picking a random number and do some math with it to see if it matches certain patterns that only prime numbers follow. If the patterns fit, the number might be a prime number, but it could also be a composite number, which means it's not prime. So the test only gives you a guess, and sometimes it's wrong. Think of it like checking if a bag of marbles has only one kind of color. If you find a few marbles of different colors, you can be pretty sure the bag has more than one color. But if all the marbles you pick look the same, you might still be wrong if there are hidden colors you can't see. The Miller-Rabin test is good at guessing, but it's not perfect. It's like playing a game where you can make a mistake, but you can improve your guesses by trying many different random numbers. The more you test, the better your chances of finding out if the number is really prime or not. The reason why it's unsolved in a perfect sense is because there's no way to be 100% sure using this test alone. It's like having a really good guessing game that can be right most of the time, but still has a tiny chance of being wrong. Yang Mills Existence and Mass Gap you're at a party of particles, and everyone's dancing. These particles are having the time of their life, until the Yang-Mills theory comes in. 
The DJ tries to mix beats for particles that refuse to dance to any rhythm. They have their preferences. Some particles prefer to dance the cha-cha, while others prefer the hip-hop style. The existence part of the problem is like trying to get all these particles to agree on a dance partner. You introduce different dance partners in the form of mathematical fields, but all of them are too picky. They will only pair up under specific conditions, and finding those conditions is the challenging part of this problem. Now for the mass gap part of the problem, think of it as the awkward silence between songs when no one seems to know what to do next. In physics, it's about discovering why particles have mass, while others don't. You're trying to discover why the particles stop dancing in the silent transition from one song to another. But the reason why no one has been able to solve this problem is trying to map out every possible way particles can interact, from the tiniest flickers of energy to the roaring energies of the cosmos, is mind-bogglingly complex and involves grappling with both theoretical math and experimental physics. It's like trying to solve a puzzle where the pieces keep changing shape when you're not looking. This is a big deal because solving this problem can lead to a better understanding of the fundamental forces that govern our universe. If we can crack this puzzle, we might unlock new insights into how particles interact, how the universe evolved after the Big Bang, and maybe even discover new realms of physics that could revolutionize technology. If you want to help unlock the secrets of the universe by proposing a solution to the Yang Mills existence and mass gap, we'd like to see your solution on our Discord. Euler's Conjecture Euler's conjecture is like a math magician's trick gone rogue. Picture Euler, a math wizard from the 18th century, saying, if you take three positive whole numbers, like one, two, and three, raise them to a power and add them up, you'll never get another number raised to that same power. It's like he's challenging numbers to a showdown and saying, you'll never get a matching power up. For example, if we take three numbers, let's say one, two, and three, and raise them to the power of four, which means multiplying them by themselves four times, Euler thought there wouldn't be another whole number that, when raised to the power of four, equals the sum of those three numbers. So let's break it down. One raised to the fourth power is one. Two raised to the fourth power is 16. Three raised to the fourth power is 81. Adding these up gives us 1 plus 16 plus 81 equals 98. Euler guessed that there was no whole number that, when raised to the fourth power, would equal 98. But here's the problem. Math geeks have tried countless numbers and powers, only to find Euler's conjecture occasionally fails, like a magician's disappearing act. For example, for the fifth power, there are numbers that fit the pattern, proving Euler's guess wrong and making mathematicians groan. Oops, there goes our theory, so you're probably wondering why it's unsolvable. Well, Euler's conjecture is tricky because as numbers get bigger, it's hard to check every single one to see if the conjecture is right or wrong. Mathematicians have found counterexamples that show Though Euler's guess doesn't always work, but proving it for all possible numbers is really, really hard. That's why Euler's conjecture is considered unsolvable with our current methods. Sophie Germain Primes you have a big box of Lego bricks, and you're trying to build a really cool castle with them. Now suppose you have a special rule for your castle, each brick must be a prime number of bricks high. A prime number is a number that only has two factors, one and itself. For example, two, three, five, and seven are prime numbers. Sophie Germain primes are a special kind of prime number with an extra twist. For a prime number to be a Sophie Germain prime, there's a little extra challenge. If you take that prime number and double it, then add one, the result should also be a prime number. Let's take a look at some examples. The number two is a Sophie Germain prime, because if you double it, which gives you four, and then add one, you get five, and five is also a prime number. Now, if you want to find Sophie Germain primes that are really big, it gets much trickier. It's like searching for those special Lego bricks among an enormous pile. Mathematicians have found some Sophie Germain primes that are very large, but it's hard to find new ones because the numbers get so huge and difficult to check. So when we say Sophie Germain primes are unsolvable, we don't mean they can't be found at all. Instead, we just mean it's a huge challenge to find them as they get bigger and bigger, and there's no easy way to predict where the next one will appear. It's like looking for a rare piece of Lego in a vast, endless sea of bricks. 